No, we got 82 people, Randy. Maybe we can get started. Okay, good. Yep, 704. Perfect. All right. All Just, right. Uh, we'll... Go ahead, Randy, if you want to introduce uh, Dr. Seeley to everybody. Um, um, yes. For everybody, though, before we get started, if you can kill your video and mute your uh, your microphones, and if you would please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Uh, Dr. Seeley will either grab them or we can <clears throat> we can run them by him as as we go here. Uh, so, with that, I'm going to turn it to Randy. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Thomas Seeley was born in 1952 in uh, Ithaca, New York. He got his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Dartmouth College. Four years later, he got his PhD in biology from Harvard University. He was the assistant professor and, uh, at, at both Yale and Cornell, and then became the uh, professor in biology at Cornell. He was a visiting fellow and professor at the uh, University of Würzburg, Germany. In 1998, he won the gold medal best science book for his book, Wisdom of the Hive. In 2016, he won the Golden Goose Award for his work on the honeybee algorithm. <laughs> In the 97, they named a bee species after him, the Neoconurella celii. How do you pronounce that? Very good. You nailed it, Randy. He's authored five books, a newspaper article, and 175 scholarly publications. His books are uh, Honey Bee Ecology, The Wisdom of the Hive, right Honey Bee Democracy, which uh, is right there. It's Everybody the should have a good book like time. that. What? He's in the and then uh, also Following the Wild Bees, and his last book, the, live, the Lives of Bees, The Untold Story of the Honey Bee in the Wild, which is the title of his uh, speech tonight. So uh, I'll just say a precursor, anybody can order one of his books on Amazon. They'll forward me the confirmation notice. Then I will attach that with a book plate and mail those to Dr. Seeley where he'll sign them, mail them back to me, We'll get them back to you, and you'll have an autographed book. <laughs> Great. That's very ingenious, Go ahead. Randy. Good. So I'll sh share my screen. And let's see. Let's see. Let me share. And let's see. There. Is that, is my um, first slide showing up on your screens? Yes, that's perfect. The lives of honeybees. Yep, beautiful picture. Good. Great. I'll arrange this, move things down here. Good. Well, good evening. And thank you, Randy, for that um, kind introduction. And it's uh, my pleasure to, to join you through the magic of Zoom this evening. Um, as Randy mentioned, the talk that I'm going to give tonight is about is all about how bees live not in our hives but out in the wild and Randy mentioned some of my educational and academic background one thing Randy didn't mention is that I've been a beekeeper since I was a teenager so I'm not just a bee, bee biologist I'm a beekeeper as well you'll see how those two things interplay in this talk what do I have to do here there we go a uh, question that may be on your minds is, uh, well, why should we look at the bees in the wild? Uh, who, who cares really about how they live all on their own? We're, we're beekeepers. Well, I think there's relevance to knowing how bees live in the wild to beekeeping. And a good way to think about this, I think, is, uh, is what Wendell Berry wrote in a book called Home Economics some years ago. He wrote, and he was referring to agriculture in general, we cannot know what we are doing until we know what nature would be doing if we were doing nothing. 
And I, I think that's really true. And it's especially true for beekeeping because we've all been beekeeping. Humans have been keeping bees for thousands of years. And modern beekeeping has been done for um, since Langstroth's time, over a hundred years. Um, but throughout that time, uh, we humans have known not very much about how bees live in the wild when they, um, when they control their lives completely. Um, the bees are very adaptable, of course, and they take to our hives and they, they can live, live well in our hives, but it is quite different as we will see. And, um, and it's, it has some disadvantages to the bees, the way we keep the bees. And so by looking to the natural lives of honeybees, we, can, we humans can um, see how we as beekeepers change their lives when we keep them in our hives, for better and for worse. So here's a roadmap for what I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to review what I and others, many others, have learned over the past 50 years about the natural lives of honeybees. This includes discovering that some wild or, or non-managed colonies are thriving, even without varroicide treatments. That's perhaps the most exciting um, thing that's been learned. And I, I, I will mention at this point, when I say a wild colony, I'm not saying that the um, I, I'm not claiming that the, these bees have necessarily different genetics than the colonies living in beekeepers' hives, but as we'll see, often they do, and, to, and that they can thrive, for example, without mite treatment. So we'll be looking at that in some detail. But in general, what I mean is when I say a wild colony, I just mean one that's a colony that's living on its own. It's not being managed. So we're going to review what we've learned about these wild colonies, and we're going to address the puzzle of how colonies are thriving in the wild. Um, and as we'll see, it's, it's a combination of the, these bees having both good genes and a good lifestyle. So it's kind of like, like ourselves. <laughs> we thrive if we have good genes and a good lifestyle. Um, as Randy mentioned, um, I've lived uh, for a long time in Ithaca, New York, both as a boy growing up there, going to school there, and then working my way back to Ithaca to be a professor at Cornell. So my study location is in Ithaca, New York, which is here in New York. Here we are over in Ohio, in case you guys are about right about here. And a close-up view of New York State. And the reason I'm showing you this is to give you a sense that New York is um, where I study these bees in the wild is actually itself quite wild. Everybody knows about New York City, but if you drive five hours up to the northeast, northwest, I mean, you'll come to Ithaca. And another feature of this map and reason I show it is that it's color coded. Where you see green is largely forest lands. And uh, the Adirondack Mountains up in the north of New York State, the Catskill Mountains, and uh, uh, part of the Appalachian Mountain chain here in Pennsylvania and in southern New York. So. We're going to be looking in, in uh, looking at how the bees are living up in the hills in the forested hills south of Ithaca. The vegetation, I give this talk for a number of places. Some people don't know what it's like to live in the Northeast US. <laughs> so I've included a couple of slides. First of all, our beautiful deciduous uh, trees color in the fall and our heavy snows and so forth in the winter. Here's a Google map, Google Earth view of looking down at Ithaca at the foot of the southern end of Cuga Lake. And, uh, and there's another place over here that'll be shown here, the Arnott Forest. This will be the focus of much of the topic of tonight's talk, where the bees are studied closely, how bees are living in, in this forest. And, but the main thing I want to show with this map is again to, is to stress how heavily wooded this, these hills are to the south of Ithaca. To the north of Ithaca, it was all plained pretty flat by the last glaciers and it's excellent farmland. But you go south of Ithaca into these hills up into the Appalachian Plateau. It's hilly, the soils are poor, and uh, the land is mostly forested. This is just a first overview of this Arnott Forest. It gives you a clear view of just how heavily covered the hills are around here. And the Sarnot Forest is really just a patch and a landscape of forest lands. It's poor farming land. If, 
what it's very good for is growing hardwood trees. And this, this big complex of buildings over here is a sawmill, a hardwood sawmill just outside the Arnott Forest. And as I say over here on the right, I've been studying the wild colonies in this Arnott Forest for 42 years. This is a forest owned by Cornell, so it's a stable place to do studies. And over these 42 years, the woods have been getting wilder and wilder. This forest, when I was a boy, there were not black bears or ravens or bobcats or fishers living in the hills south of Ithaca, but now there are. So it's been fun watching it get wilder and wilder over the last many decades. Here's a glimpse of what this part of the world or part of New York State looks like. When you're up on the top of the Arnott Hills in the Arnott Forest and you look out, this is what you see, just forests covering the hills as far as you can see. This was taken, of course, during uh, in September, October, during the peak of fall color. Well, I started my studies in the Arnott Forest in August of 1978. And it, this was the first step of, for me of taking a look at how, uh, starting to learn about how honeybees colonies live in the wild. And my basic question at the beginning was, was a very simple one. It was just how common are wild colonies? Nobody knew. I searched all the books I could find on, about bees and biology on this topic, and there was no information about the abundance of wild colonies. Um, so I went to the Arnott Forest, which is about an area of about seven square miles. And as I mentioned already, it's surrounded by much more forest, but I focused on the Arnott Forest because it's, own, it's a private forest owned by Cornell, so it's protected. And I went to this forest and I mapped out, I did a partial mapping of where the wild colonies are in the forest and thus learning, began to learn how many of them there are. And you might be wondering, how does one locate wild colonies? These are the colonies living in hollow trees. You use um, the technique called bee hunting, and it's also called bee lining. Here's how it works. You, um, the key tool is this little box I'm holding in my hands here. It's called a bee box <laughs> or bee hunting box. And it's a, just a little device that allows you to capture a bunch of bees in the front chamber. Well, to capture bees in the front chamber by snapping the box, the door shut on a flower that has a bee on it. And then once you've got the bee caught in the front chamber, you raise this sliding divider and you open a window in the rear and the bee, which wants to escape, goes towards the light. And then she goes to the rear of the bee box and then you close the sliding divider. And so you've caught a bee. And you can do this over and over till you get maybe five, six, seven, bees caught in the rear chamber. And then what you do is you open up the front chamber and put in a little comb filled with sugar water. And then you raise the sliding divider and leave everything closed for about five minutes. And the bees will discover your comb filled with sugar syrup in the front chamber. And so, and when you open the door, they will come out, they'll groom themselves, clean themselves up, fly home, and now you've introduced those bees to an excellent food source. And they, if the, unless there's a honey flow on, those bees will come back and they'll bring other bees with them. So start by going to a patch of flowers, catch bees in the bee box. Once you've got bees in the box, you add a comb filled with sugar water, sugar syrup, and then you take that out of the box. You can set it on a little stand or a little table, whatever, or a chair and other bees will come to it, and then you have a traffic of bees which can lead you home, back to their home. First step, if once you've got the, the bees visiting your feeder, is to determine the direction they fly home. That's known as determining the bee line. And then you move your operation step by step down the bee line towards the bees' home. Here's an example of a bee hunt that I did on the Cornell campus one spring. I caught bees in a flower garden here, and uh, saw that the bees were, I couldn't tell if they were flying north or to, over to the northeast. I thought at first they were going to the northeast. So I caught bees here. Once I got the line strongly established, I moved my feeding station to this location. And then it became clear they're actually going north, not northeast. And then I moved the feeding station here, and then to here, then to here. And um, each, each, each of these moves takes about an hour because you've change the location. It takes a while for the bees to 
learn the new location. And by um, about four o'clock, I got to this point and I could see that the bees were going off in this direction. And I could also time the bees. And I, I saw that it was only taking them about two or three minutes to leave my feeding station, go home and then reappear at the feeder because I had labeled the bees with paint marks so I could follow the behavior of individuals. So then I searched down the bee line and I came to this tree and I saw bees going in and out of this knot hole. Now you might wonder how on earth can a human being look up a tall oak tree like that and see bees going in and out of a knot hole? Well, the reason that's doable is because when the bees are coming and going from their entrance, just like with our hives, they're flying around and our eyes are very good at detecting moving objects. And so when you're a bee hunter and you're closing in on a bee tree, what you look for is the, the flight of bees flying around a knot hole in a tree. So it's, it's not as, in other words, it's not as hard as to finally find the precise entrance opening as it might seem. It, incidentally, if you're interested in this, um, Randy mentioned a book that I wrote called Following the Wild Bees, which is about the craft and the science of bee hunting. It's just, it's fun. It's another way of having fun with bees. I think you can be a beekeeper, a bee hunter, and, and also a, a, a bee trapper, but that's another, that bee trapping is another story. Anyhow, back to the Arnott Forest and the wild colonies. So here's one of the surveys I did. And I, for example, I'll walk you through how it works, this bee hunting process to locate the wild colonies living in a forest. I went to the back entrance of the, of the forest, which was here. I caught bees on f flowers, goldenrod, and uh, introduced them to my feeder. And uh, soon I saw that some of the bees were flying to the south and some were flying to the north. And so using the process I just described, I worked my way down bit by bit along the bee line till I came to the tree where the bees were living, tree A. That took me about a day. And then I went back to where the starting point knew that there were bees going north. I got some of those bees and I started going down a, north, a bee line to the north and I found that tree. Then what I did is I shut down the feeder here and moved about half a mile down the road to another patch of, of goldenrod. And so I got a fresh batch of bees and now I again just saw where were the bees going. Well, some of them were going to this, off in this direction, which went back to bee tree A. So I didn't have to worry about them. I already knew their home. I also saw, however, that some bees were going up to the northwest, and that by following that bee line, that took me to bee tree C. And then I went to this location, bee lines here, one went back to bee tree B. One bee line took me to a fourth bee tree up here, and another uh, line of bees was flying outside the forest, but because they were going outside the forest, I didn't pursue it. The point is that this it's just a, to find these wild colonies and to map out their locations in the forest. It's just a matter of setting up um, a bee hunting operation at various points in the forest and then work, working, working my way back down to the bee trees. And I didn't have time that to search the entire forest. I searched, as you can see, about 50% of its area. I searched the western half, basically. And what did I find? Well, I found, uh, let's see, oops. Uh, I found eight bee trees, <laughs> A through H in half the forest. So that tells us there were about 16 wild colonies in the forest. So that works out to about two and a half wild colonies per square mile. Here's what some of the trees were that I found. One, here's what I call the easy ash tree. It was, it was easy because it was, um, it was uh, the bees were living in the largest tree and that little pat that patch of the section of the forest and their nest entrance was very visible in the fall. Uh, I could see them easily flying around this knot hole. There was another bee tree that I found which was a, also the opposite end of ease of discovery. This one was very difficult. The bees were, I could I aligned the bees to this tree but I could never see where they were going in their nest until I climbed up the hemlock next to it and could look across and I could see the bees were had their entrance between in the fork of these two parts of the tree and they, they were diving down into a crack at the fork there. That was their entrance. And here's a, another tree that I found that fall. Um, 
I call it the deceptive aspen because usually the bees are nesting in large diameter trees, but this this aspen was only about one foot in diameter um, down at ground at uh, breast height, so uh, that was rather small. So I walked past this bee tree several times before realizing, oh, that's where the bees that's where they're nesting. They were living in that knot hole, probably probably in a cavity that was started by a woodpecker. Um, a typical, what, is, what does one of these bee trees look like? Well, let's look a little more carefully at it. The, um, the entrances are usually high off the ground, uh, usually more than 15 feet up. These bees in the wild like to nest high up, and we'll come back to that, but it has to do with safety from black bears. It may also give the bees a warmer place to, uh, warmer, uh, a better place to be in the winter, a better entrance to have in the winter when the snow is deep. Their entrance is not plugged, and instead the sunshine shines brightly on the bark of the tree high up. The entrances of these natural bee tree homes tend to be quite small, less than three square inches. So that's much smaller than the front of a Langstroth hive, which is about 12 square inches. And the cavities, the cavities they're living in, are quite modest compared to our, our hives. The, the modal volume, and we'll come back to this, is about the volume of one deep hive body, 10 frame hive body. So the nest cavities are smaller than our hives. The entrances are smaller and their entrances are higher than with our hives. So come back to this question, how common are the wild colonies? As I mentioned, 1978, I found nine colonies and hunting half the forest. So that works out to about 2.5 wild colonies per square mile. I had no idea what what it whether that whether um, at the time I had no idea whether that was um, unusual or not. And since there, since that this time I found that consistently over the years in the Arnott Forest, and I've looked with another with another um, colleague. We've looked in another forest um, outside of Ithaca. We find the same density, and a team of biologists from the Carnegie Museum has looked in a forest in western Pennsylvania, and they've also found about that density. So about two and a half per square mile. So in 1978, when I was doing, starting this, these investigations, I found nine wild colonies. And that's where I left the story, because I got an answer to that question. I didn't think it would be needed to go back. But then in 1993, Varroa arrived. And like probably everybody, um, I didn't know what to do with Varroa at first, and I lost for two winters in a row, I recall, losing about 80% of my colonies um, before I learned how to start using Varroa sides. Um, so by the end of the 1990s, I thought, Pa, oh, poor bees up in the Arnott Forest, nobody's get helping them deal with Varroa, I bet they're all gone. But in 2002, I, I said, Tom, you've really got to check that, see what's going on in that forest. And when I went back in 2002, I found eight wild colonies, again, searching half of the, of the area of the Arnott Forest. So in fact, there were as many colonies in 2002, uh, about 10 years after the arrival of Varroa, as there was in 1978, 15 years before the arrival of Varroa. And since then, in 2011, I again went back to the Arnott Forest and again, searching half the forest, I found this time 10 colonies. So the numbers, they, they move around a little bit, but it's there's consistently a population of colonies living in this forest, even though Varroa arrived in the mid 1990s. So how does, how is this possible? Well, one possibility is that I thought at first, back in the um, 2002, when I discovered that bees were still in the forest, I thought, well, maybe these colonies are not infested with Varroa. After all, this forest, this Arnott forest is quite remote. It's not an area where beekeeping is popular. There's one beekeeper in the area. Um, but I thought, well, they're up on this hillside, they're up on this hilltop, far, far even from that beekeeper's hives, several miles. So maybe the Varroa just doesn't get around very well and they haven't gotten to the forest. So to see whether the wild colonies in the Arnott Forest had Varroa, I put up bait hives. And when I say a bait hive, that's mean an old Langstroth hive put up on a couple of boards 
I reduced the entrance, put a, um, a screen over the entrance so the mice can't get in, and I put in 10 old combs in the hive. I put it up in the tree, and the bees like them. These, are, these bait hives are very attractive because the combs, it's a perfectly complete home for the bees. And in the summers of 2003 and 2004, I caught 11 colonies in my bait hives. And the, the, with respect to Baroa, the, the, the answer was clear. There were every, every colony that appeared in one of my bait hives had Baroa. So yes, in fact, the bees living in the Arnott Forest are surviving, even though they all have Baroa. Uh, one colony came in with one swarm came in and developed shock brood, but none of the none of the other neither of the foul broods has appe ever appeared in those colonies. But the key conclusion here is that the wild colonies in this forest, and this forest is nothing special; it just happens to be a forest owned by Cornell. These wild colonies uh, in the woods around Ithaca do have varroa, and yet and yet they are persisting, and that brings us to the mystery of this talk. How are they managing to do this? How are these wild colonies able to persist without being treated for varroa? Well, to answer that question, we can think in, in terms of two possible general avenues of, of resistance. Um, maybe there's, the bees have good genes, have genes that encode behaviors or other traits that enable them to fight the varroa. Um, but the other possibility is it's not good genes, uh, or in addition to good genes, perhaps, um, there's good lifestyle. Maybe the colony spacing, the wide spacing of the colonies helps. Maybe the nest site helps them. Is there something about their nest structure or other factors? So we're going to look now at how these wild colonies are able to persist without being treated for varroa. We'll first look at the possibility of good genes and then good lifestyle. And the reason that good genes seem like a good possibility is that these wild colonies, they, they have the varroa. And even though I didn't track the, bee, the wild colonies um, while the, when the varroa moved into the population of colonies in the Arnott Forest, it seems almost certain that there was heavy mortality of those colonies in those colonies, just as there was in all the beekeepers' colonies. And as we'll see, that was the case. That there, in fact, there has been strong natural selection for varroa resistance in, in the wild colonies. And not just the wild colonies in the Arnott Forest, but the wild colonies in general. Well, let's look at that. Now, you might wonder, well, how do I know that wild colonies have experienced strong natural selection for varroa resistance? Well, fortunately, and this was by, not by plan, but by good fortune. Back in 1977, before um, I was just starting to do preliminary work in the Arnott Forest, I was putting up bait hives and I was catching swarms of bees in the Arnott Forest. And every time I caught a swarm of bees in a bait hive, I would take, I would collect about 30 worker bees. And I'd um, put them pin, as pinned specimens, I put them in the Cornell University insect collection. And I did that in the Arnott for wild colonies that I was finding in the Arnott forest and in other forests south of Ithaca. So I had a whole set of what of pinned specimens of honeybees from the mid, late 1970s. And then in 2011, I went back to those same locations and caught more wild bees. Again, I found bee trees in the Arnott Forest and I found bee trees in other forests south of Ithaca. Then, what, so I had samples of bees before Varroa and after Varroa. And with using the, of some fancy genetic techniques, um, it's possible to compare the genes, the genetics of the bees before and after Varroa and see what, what changes have occurred in the bees. Here's again, this is just a, an aerial view that shows that where bees were collected in 1977 and again in 20, 2011. And both times I sampled 32 wild colonies, some in the Arnott Forest, others in other forested areas around Ithaca. One of the things that became clear very quickly 
based on what's called the mitochondrial DNA. This is the DNA that's inherited um, through just from passing from mothers to daughters. Um, is that the wild colonies experienced a big loss in the reduction of queen matrilines. Um, um, the number of mother, mother uh, queen lineages used to be quite, they used to be very diverse back in 1977. You can think of this as a, like a family tree of queen bees. And back in the 70s, the family tree of queen bees had a lot of branches on it. it they had a lot of ancestors, distant ancestors, lots of different different ancestors, lots of different ancestors. <laughs> Sorry, try to say that correctly. In 1977, the queen bees had lots of different ancestors. But in 2011, there's only the ancestral, there were in fact um, about, uh, memory fails me now, I think there were about um, 15 different maternal lines of the queen bees in 1977. In 2011, there are just three. One queen, one colony's queen came, had her ancestry was from this maternal line, and all of the others came from these two lines, this group here and this group down here. And what this is, this is a genetic, um, this is a genetic signature that the colony, the population of colonies in these forests south of Ithaca went through a bo population bottleneck. And only some of them, only some of the uh, queen lineages survived. And this is a strong marker of powerful natural selection. Most, almost ever, uh, 90, 80 to 90 percent of the colonies were killed off during 1977 and 2011. And almost certainly that was just what was killing them off was Varroa. Another thing that we learned and was just how much genetic change has occurred if we look at at the across the each of the chromosomes of each worker of the of of the of the bees each each um, the bees from each colony uh, each bee has sixteen chromosomes and if you look across each chromosome you can see where there have been massive genetic changes changes that are too too large to have had the to occur by chance alone. So these are each where you see a red dot and each black bar represents the, the genetic information in a chromosome. Worker bees have 16 chromosomes, 16 pairs. Um, you can see all these red dots. So there are many, many places where there's been strong genetic change. Again, probably due to, to natural selection, 634 sites and about um, about half of those are sites that we know are related to bee development. The others we know less about. But huge amounts of genetic change between 77 and 2011. Some of the change, what are some of these changes? Or what if some of these, what are some of the changes um, that are produced by these genetic changes? Well, one thing is morph there are morphological changes. The old bees from 1977 were a little bit bigger. There, these are measurement of head width. Um, the old bees and then the modern bees, a little bit noticeably smaller. Bees are a little smaller. And this is the intertegular span, or that's the span between the wing joints on the thorax. So both measures are very easy to make and they're very clear. The bees have gotten a little bit smaller in 2011 than they were in 1977. They're also, we've, learned that there have been some real behavioral changes. Um, and one thing that we know now is these wild colonies workers are very good at killing adult mites. Um, they can bite the mites, um, pull off their legs, crunch even the, even crunch the exoskeleton of the mite. And, but they're especially good at uncapping brood cells with varroa. And just that act of uncapping the brood cells with a varroa disrupts the Varroa's reproduction. Don't fully understand the mechanisms of that, but these um, the workers in these wild colonies are very good at dealing with Varroa, keeping the Varroa populations in check. And I want to um, share with you now um, the results of an experiment I did recently that just back in 2019, summer of 
2019, where I made a comparison of the mite counts and the survival of colonies in colonies that were untreated for varroa, that received no varroa treatments, uh, and in which the colonies were headed by a qu queens from one of, uh, but from three different sources. Some of the colonies were headed by queens that are caught in bay tides, placed in the forests outside of Ithaca. These are what I'll call the wild stock colonies. And there were six of them. Uh, there were five queens, I'll call the Russian stock, which were purchased from a treatment-free beekeeper in Vermont named Kirk Webster. Um, he's been uh, a successful commercial beekeeper without treating his bees for varroa uh, for about 20 years. And the third group of queens were those that I purchased from one of the large commercial queen producers in California. It was a, called, a company called Oliveras. They do, uh, like all the big queen producers, treat their colonies vigorously with varroa sides. And the kind of queens I bought from Oliveras were what they call their VSH Italian. And VSH stands for varroa sensitive hygienic. So they, these were queens that supposedly have some mechanism of mechanisms of resistance to varroa. So six wild stock colonies, five Russian stock colonies, and seven VSH Italian colonies. And what I did with these queens is I installed each, each queen was installed in a colony that was started as a two-frame nuke in June 2019. And so here's the seven nukes that were set up with the VSH Italian queens from Oliveras. This there in this group is another group of colonies here that was set up with the Russian the, the Russian queens from Kirk Webster, and then the wild caught queens are down here in this third group of hives. Each so each colony started out the same size as a two frame nuke. The bees and brood came from the same source colonies. In other words, um, the colonies in each. <laughs> let's, see, let's see if I can say this clearly. Um, each of these, for every colony that's in, to set up a colony in, in these three groups, uh, I would get, um, take bees. Uh, for the first colony in each, each of these three groups, I would take all the bees from the same source colony. So they started out with workers and bees and, and mites, all from the same, same source colony. And then the second colony in each group would come from a second source colony and so forth. And then each colony was left alone all summer. No varroa treatments. Summer, just so from June 2019 on till June, um, as we'll see, April and May 2020, the colonies were just completely on their own. The only thing I did is I would look and take some data every once in a while, look inside the colonies. What did I find? Oh, well, first of all, just an aerial view to show you that this is what we call a common garden experiment. You've got three types of colonies, You've got ones with wild caught queens, Russian queens, and these Italian, VSH Italians. They're all in this, all along the same hedgerow. So they're all in the same environment. The only difference between the, and they're all in the same size hives. They started out the same size. The only difference was the kind of queen that the colonies received in the three groups. And here's what I found over the course of this experiment. Uh, so again, the three queen types, Wildcott, Kirk Webster, and Oliveras. And there were six colonies, the six, five, and seven. All the colonies were queen right in October. And here are the mite counts of, for the colonies in each group. Three, for the Wildcott, you can see 3, 22, 5, 1, 1, 1. So there was, a, there was variation in these wild caught colonies. Most of them had very few mites, but one of them had a lot of mites. The Webster queen colonies, um, they all had very low mite counts. And the Oliveras group, they all had very high mite counts. These are uh, quite high, these are dangerously high mite counts, except for this one that had only four. And I'll come back to that colony. That turns out to be a pretty special colony. And we see in the last column, what percent colonies were alive in the, the next spring in April 2020? Well, six out of seven of these colonies in the wild caught were alive. Not surprisingly, this one colony, which had 22 mites per 300 bees, was, and thus was a, really a dud in terms of mite control, was the one that died over winter. 
all of the Kirk Webster colonies were alive, and only one of the Oliveris VSH co queen colonies was alive. And it was this one that had a very low mite count. And that colony, uh, so that colony had the right stuff, uh, but it was only one of seven. And interesting, that colony that had the right stuff is probably one of the meanest colonies I've ever experienced. And um, so it, it's, um, I've just put it off on, on in a hive off on its own and just left it. It's too hard to work. But it's very good at killing, controlling the varroa and keeping itself alive. So what can we conclude? Well, in this, from this experiment, we saw that there was greater heterogeneity among colonies headed by wild-caught queens than commercially produced ones. So when you capture wild swarms, you, sometimes you get great stock, and every once in a while you get some really some poor stock. I found lower mite counts in the colonies with a wild-caught than the Webster queens versus the Oliveras queens. I found higher winter survival by colonies with a wild-caught and Webster queens versus the Oliveras. But, and the bottom line is, there do exist out there bees with good mite resistance. I don't think you'll get them from the big commercial queen producers, but you will get them if, you, if you're in an area where there is a, a population of wild colonies that nobody is treating, because those are being selected for resistance to varroa. And that's what I'm finding in Ithaca, at least. And you can also get queens with good mite resistance by buying them from a non-treatment uh, beekeeper or queen producer, such as Kirk Webster. Well, at this point, maybe I should pause and see if there are questions. I'm not real familiar with the chat box, but let me see if I can figure out how to use that. Oh, here it is. Uh, chat. Is it chat? The doctor's voice is muffled. Oh. Let's see. I think we did a sound check early on, but is this okay? Uh, we can hear you good. It's yeah. fine. Okay. Next. Uh, we can, we can, is it, would it be helpful to have somebody read the questions? Yeah, that might be. Yeah, that, that, that way I don't have to think about where which ones I've done and haven't done. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Should I do it, Robert, or you want to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Randy. Okay, so let's see. Uh, do you collect new bees at each station or use the same group of bees initially caught? Hmm. Let's see, I'm not sure I understand the question um, yeah, I don't but, know there. I don't what what know. I do do is once I find a place that where I can catch wild swarms, if I have good, for some reason, some places I get a lot of swarms. Some sites where I put out a bait hive are very effective and others, others I don't catch many swarms. So I just keep, but, but over time I've learned where the good places are. Okay, in genetics, in the genetic study, did you find that different maternal lines had distinctly different genetic changes to cope with varroa mites, or did they have uh, similar genetic changes? Yeah, I wish I could answer that question, but no, the analysis didn't didn't go to, has not gone down that route to see whether the right whether the in the different lines the different queen lines the um, the similar changes have occurred. No, haven't done that. That would that would be a much that would be a more deeper analysis, but haven't done that. Okay, and they says was wild stock from 1977 and 2011 evaluated to see if there were of same genetic base or had there been an addition of other stock, Italian, Carniolan. Yeah, the the analysis that we did wouldn't wouldn't reveal that because we didn't have it's a little hard to characterize just looking at the genes whether the a queen is of of an italian stock or um uh, or one of the other races of bees so no we haven't we haven't done that all we can say is that the um the bees changed 
the popul at the population level, there are large, big genetic differences between 1977 and 2011. And that's, let's say, okay, a couple more. Regarding the wild colonies you discovered, was the entrance oriented in a specific direction, east, south, or random? Yeah, I'll come back to that. Um, it's almost, it's, pre it's predominantly uh, south. So it's southeast, south, or southwest. The bees are, the bees really like south-facing entrances. South-facing, interesting. Uh, let's see, is it wise to help populate the wild bees in the wild by purposefully causing a hive to cause swarming and set up trees that have a cavity to lure them and then monitor them? Yeah. Well, you could, you could do that. Um, I think it's, I would, but I think the best thing is to, is to go in the other direction and just to um, make use of those wild colonies as sources of swarms because the stock that we're, most beekeepers can have access to um, is probably not going to, um, if, they bought, if, they're, if their colonies are headed by queens, they bought from a commercial queen producer. I don't think they're helping the wild population because those colonies seem to, at least in my study um, with the Oliveris queens, they really have poor genetic resistance to Varroa. Hmm. And that's it. Yeah, okay. So let's go to the next part of this presentation. Perfect. Let's see. So we've looked at, coming back to this question, how the wild colonies are able to persist without being treated. We've looked at, we've seen the, uh, there's evidence that the bees have genetically based, have genetically influenced traits that give them resistance. So part of the story is good genes who they are. Let's now look at this good lifestyle. And this will, this will address the question, one of those questions that we just um, considered. When we're gonna, I'm going to focus on three things, colony spacing, nest sites features, and the nest structure. As those, and those are all parts of, their, of how the bees live. The spacing of their colonies, what their nests are like, and what their, what their, their home sites are like. Let's first look at colony spacing. And to, to build, and here I want to build on some, the map that I showed earlier about the spacing of colonies in the wild in the Arnard Forest. And I didn't stress this, but here's a scale down here of a mile. And here's the spacing of colonies. And if you go through this, you find that on average, the colonies are spaced not a full mile apart, but um, about six tenths of a mile on average of uh, spacing, and, and that's of course in marked contrast to what you what we have in our in our apiary. This is one of my bee yards, and I've got hives you know close together. Two uh, I use double hive stands, and so some of the colonies are you know within a, a foot apart, and. This is a huge change in the ecology of honeybees when they're living this close together versus in a scattered arrangement as in the wild. And it's, it's something we do for our convenience. That's why I do it. And, um, but it also, of course, um, not only helps us, but it helps to spread parasites and pathogens, it helps the parasites and pathogens get from one colony to another. We'll look at that more closely now. <clears throat> I did an experimental study of the effects of colony spacing on the drifting of bees and the spread of disease. And these were the two questions. If colonies, if hives or colonies are dispersed, is there less drift of bees among colonies? And secondly, if there's dispersed, is there less spread of diseases, specifically varroa, through drifting? So let's look at this experiment. The experiment um, involved two arrays of hives of bees in each group of, there was one group of colonies were um, crowded together like a normal beekeeping arrangement. <coughs> it's a very typical arrangement of, for a commercial beekeeper in New York, central New York state, put them on double hive stands and put the hive stands pretty close together. So 12 of the colonies were in this array and the other 12 colonies were 
more widely scattered. Here's one here, and then there's another one down here. Both groups of colonies were in the same general area. And here's an aerial view of looking down, or a, a, a map looking down. The apiary colonies are here in this map, and then the dispersed colonies are here and here and here and here and here. And here's a scale of 50, 50 yards, 100 yards or meters apart. So the, in, this, in this experimental study, I had 12 colonies here and 12 colonies here. So they're all the 24 colonies are in the same general area, but 12 of them are crowded in an apiary and the other 12 are more widely dispersed, 30 to 50 meters apart. Not, not, not as far apart as in the Arnott Forest, to be sure, but more, much more widely spaced than in a typical apiary. And another thing about this experiment is I set all the colonies up at the same time, all the colonies in both groups, and they're all matched in size. Um, they're even matched in their queens. They all started with queens from one commercial queen producer. Um, and another thing that was identical for all of the colonies is that none of the colonies received a varroa treatment. So they're all you know, sink or swim all on their own. And I wanted to look at, but my main focus was on the uh, effect of colony spacing on drone drifting and, and this, um, spread of diseases. And the way I looked at, was able to measure the, the drifting of drones was when I set up these colonies, in each group, 10 of the colonies were headed by a Wooten Golden Italian queen. So they only, those queens produce only bright yellow drones. Um, and the other two colonies in each group were headed by New World Carniolan queens. Those, are, those produce very dark bees, especially dark drones. So 10 of the colonies were making bright yellow or cordovan drones, and two of the colonies are making dark brown drones. And that's true for the colonies in, in both groups. And in both groups, the two colonies were making the dark drones were in the center of the array. These two here and these two here were the one headed by the queens with the producing dark brown drones. And this setup enabled me to compare the amount of drone drifting among, among the colonies in each array. What I found is that when I went into the 10 colonies with golden Italian queens and I looked and I um, looked at their drones, I found that 24% of, of the drones in the colonies with the golden Italian queens, which were making only golden Italian drones, 24% of the drones in those colonies were dark drones. So they came from one of, from these two hives. So there was a lot of drifting of the drones in, con in the apiary. In contrast, in this other group of 12 colonies, there were 0% dark drones in the colonies with golden Italian queens. So just by spacing the colonies um, 10, to, 10 to 30 meters apart, you, uh, the drifting of drones drops dramatically. So, and that's the mixing. And so that's a comparison of the effects of colony spacing on, that reveals the effects of colony spacing on drone drift, but it also applies probably to worker drift. So if the colonies are widely dispersed, one colony spacing. Is there less drift of bees among colonies? Yes, for sure with drones and almost certainly for workers as, as well. I also, in this experiment, I also looked at colony survival. And the question is, if dispersed, was there better colony survival? The answer here is yes. In the, I left after two years, and I, again, I wanna stress, none of these colonies were treated, none were fed, or was sink or swim all on their own. In the crowded group, zero of, of the 12 colonies were alive after two years. In, in the dispersed group, it was five out of 12 that were alive after, after two years. And, and again, I want to stress, none of the colonies were treated for varroa. And I think what, what created this difference is that when the colonies were more widely dispersed, there was less drifting of bees and less spreading of varroa from colonies that were collapsing to other colonies. And um, probably there was, there may have also been less robbing of colonies in the wide, in the dispersed group than in the crowded group. Whatever the mechanism was, it resulted in a, a very, a marked difference in survival, even after two years. 
So colony spacing is part of how these wild colonies are able to persist without being treated for varroa. What about nest sites? Well, as we've seen already in the wild, the nests are in these, in where I live, they're, they're in buildings, but um, they're also in trees, such as we see here. And uh, this is something I've mentioned in passing already, that the size of the nest cavities is, uh, these nest cavities are relatively small. They're only, a, on average, they're about the volume of one deep 10 frame hive body. You can see that here. This is the distribution of the nest cavities of 20, I think it was 21 bee trees that I collected their nests and measured the cavity volumes by refilling the, taking out the columns and refilling the cavity with sand. And this is the distribution. It's measured down here in liters, but you can convert that to Langstroth hive bodies as I've done with these red arrows. And none of them, almost none, were, were two deeps or, or, or larger. And most of them were right around the range of about one deep hive body, some smaller than one deep and some a little bit larger than one deep hive body. So the bees are living in the wild in relatively small nest cavities. And you might wonder, well, how, why is that? Is that just what the nest cavities are that are available in, na in nature? And it turns out the answer is no. The bees selectively are avoiding really small cavities and really large cavities. And I know that because I did experiments and I put out, in which I put out nest boxes that were identical in all ways. They're all the same shape, same color, same size entrance, et cetera, except that in, one box was 10 liters, one box was 40 liters, and one box was 100 liters. And these were all put out in trios on along hedgerows. The boxes were about 30 feet apart, mounted on trees. And what I found was that the bees avoided these little cavities, these little boxes, and they avoided the big boxes, but they always went into the 40 liter box. Never did the 10, never did the 100, but to the 40, yes. So these, what, what we've seen that the bees are living in small nest cavities, um, and, but how does that help affect the population dynamics of Aurora? Well, as you all know, when, you, when bees live in a small hive, they're much more prone to swarming. So bees living in the wild occupy these one deep hive body sized nest cavities almost certainly they, they swarm frequently. And does that uh, reduce varroa? That was the question. So I did an experiment where, again, two groups of 12 colonies. In one group, the colonies were set up um, such they lived in one deep hive body for several years. In the other group, they lived in four deep, four deep hive bodies. That's a typical commercial setup in New York State. And all 24 colonies, again, two groups, two groups of 12 colonies, all 24 colonies were established at the same time in 2012, June 2012. And again, like in the previous experiment, all of the colonies, none of the colonies was treated for varroa throughout the experiment. So this is sink or swim, just looking at, because I wanted to see the effects of colony size and nest cavity size and swarming on mite, mite levels. And what were the effects of living in a small nest cavity? And I want to, oh, I should stress that these two groups of 12 colonies were near each other. This, this is the, the group with the large hives is on one side of this building and the other group of the bees in the small hives was on a, was also near that building. So in the summer of 2013, and these experiments were set up then, and set up uh, 10 out of 12 swarmed in the small group. In the large hive group, only two out of 12 swarmed. So that's a big difference, and that wasn't surprising. That's why we beekeepers put hives that we want to be productive of honey in large hives, so they don't swarm and have lots of storage space. And here's what I found with the mite counts. These colonies were all set up in July 2012 as, as just little nucleus colonies. So nothing really happened in them over the summer of 2013, except that they got larger and they stored up honey. And their mite levels were under, were, were quite low for the first summer because they started out as tiny little colonies. 
but they all survived to May 2013. And in the next summer, the second summer, you can see the mite counts were very different between the two groups. The colonies in large hives, the mites went up and up and up. And that's why so most of them died at the end of the summer of 2013. Whereas in the colonies in the small hives, the mite levels never got very high. In fact, at the end of the summer, it was instead of being 6.2 per 100 bees, it was only 1.1 for the colonies in small hives. Why was that? Well, oh, and I'll, I'll, it's because the colonies in small hives swarmed, as we saw, 8 out of 12 versus 2 out of. Um, uh, if we go back. 10 out of 12 swarmed in the small hive group, only 2 out of 12 swarmed in the large hive group. And what was the survival? Well, in the large hive group, um, two, it, the, 2 of the 12 colonies survived, and the small hive group, 10 of, tw of the 12 colonies survived. So uh, it looks like swarming has an effect on varroa control. Interesting, there was, again, these experiments often reveal some very interesting colonies. One of these colonies in the large hive group that survived was an excellent Varroa killer colony. And again, it was a very nasty colony, extremely. Uh, I dreaded opening that hive up to take, to, to take the measurements of the data. It was just painful to work that colony. And it, it's still alive from 20, 2012 on. I just park it in a remote apiary and just, and just keep an eye on it and see what's doing. It's still a very, very nasty colony, a very hard to work colony, but also a very good, excellent defense against Varroa. So does nest site, coming back to this general question, how are these wild colonies able to persist without being treated for Varroa? Turns out the nest site is important too. The, the small nest cavities and the swarming helps them deal with Varroa. And we don't know this fully, but it certainly makes sense that having a swarming create um, will help colonies deal with varroa because swarming creates a break in the brood. When there's a break in the brood rearing, there's a period of time when the varroa can't reproduce. It's also a period of time when the varroa can't hide in cells of capped brood, so they're vulnerable to, to grooming by the, by the bees. So swarming has a big effect on the, the colony's ability to resist varroa. And that swarming is, uh, arises because the colonies are nesting in smaller cavities than our, than our hives. The last thing I'll mention or topic I'll mention is the nest structure. We've looked at a little bit already that the <clears throat> in the wild, the bees living in trees, the entrances are high off the ground, they're relatively small. As we can see here, looking inside that tree, remember that volume that you see here is just one bee pipe body's worth of comb. But there are other differences about not just the cavity size and the entrance size. The cav nest cavity walls are very thick in nature. In, in these trees, the wood is 4 to 12 inches thick, and this provides much better nest insulation for these colonies in trees. And to see just how different that is, here's, these, are the track, these are the temperature records in three empty um, cavities. Um, the blue line is the temperature record, and this is across the uh, several a week and uh, about a couple of weeks in April 2018. The temperature recording inside a tree cavity, and there are no bees in here. It's just a, it's a cavity that um, uh, could be occupied by a wild colony bees, but I didn't I didn't want any bees living in there. I just wanted to see what the temperature dynamics were like in an empty cavity of a thick walled tree cavity. And you can see it's, it doesn't jump around very much. It's quite stable. The ambient temperature is shown by the black line. And the, I had also a box near the tree. And, and, and it was a box built out of one inch thick pine boards. It was the sh same volume, same shape as the tree cavity. And it just jumps around like the ambient temperature. So the bottom line is that our our wooden boxes have almost no insulation. And this is something, it's almost as if the bees, in terms of temperature dynamics, it's almost as if they didn't even have a box around them. They were like they were in an open 
the ambient, so the temperature fluctuations in an empty box like a beehive are almost identical to ambient. Whereas in a tree, everything's sort of very different, very stable. How that affects the bees, I'm not sure, but I think it's be much, I'd rather, if I were gonna live, I would rather live in this be better, uh, a site with better insulation. And that's actually something where I think, though that nobody's really looked at it as thoroughly as it needs to be examined, that we, well, that's one thing we can really, probably really help our bees with is to give their hives much better insulation. And when I say better insulation, I mean something like an inch and a half of, of, um, of foam insulation on the walls and on the, on the lid. Another thing that was found different between the wild colonies is that the cells are a little bit smaller, 5.4 millimeters wall to wall dimension versus thin comb foundation. It's a little smaller. I don't know what the effect of that is, but it, it is a difference. One thing that's also different is the propolis. There's a lot of propolis coating on the tree cavities, the walls of tree cavities, because the wood, if the bees didn't put down this propolis, the wooden walls in these cavities often will be this stringy, fibrous, rotted wood material, which would be, if it's damp, would be a superb substrate for microbial, microbes to grow, bacteria and fungi and so forth. But instead, the bees coat that wood even if they have a cavity with those walls, they will coat it and with propolis to seal it off. And what you're seeing here is a, is a portion of a wall inside a natural nest cavity where I've chipped off, I've chipped away the propolis layer on the wood so you can see what's beneath it. <clears throat> this, is a, this is the floor of a wild colony's nest where they even plastered the floor with, uh, with propolis. And it was obviously a squirrel had lived in this cavity because you can see these it looks like hickory nuts that have been opened by the squirrel and just dropped to the bottom of the cavity before the bees make them. So nest structure, what, are we see, what have we seen are the consequences of living in small nest cavities with good insulation and more propolis on the walls? Well, colonies will have small brood nests and small colonies. Yes, is there more colony reproduction through swarming and drone rearing in these small nest cavities with good insulation and so forth? Yes, there is more reproduction. Is there less thermal stress? Yes. Is there less disease stress? Evidently, because especially because of the propolis and also because of the uh, swarming and so forth that leads, helps control the varroa. So coming back to the big question, how are these wild colonies able to persist without being treated for varroa? Well, I hope I've um, convince you that there's two parts to the answer to this question. One is the good genes. Bees are resistant in the wild because they're undergoing natural selection for resistance, but it's also a matter of, in part, of good lifestyle. The wild colonies are more widely spaced, so there's less robbing, less spread of, of diseases. The nest site favors swarming, and the nest structure itself is, is, is better for the bees. It's, it's well insulated. It's a small cavity and it has propolis all over the walls. So just to summarize, what we've seen is that colonies of European honeybees can survive without chemical treatments for varroa. Um, colonies in the wild have experienced strong natural selection in the last 25 years, probably due to varroa. We see that, we know that from the genetic analysis. And we've seen that the colonies in nature live quite differently than colonies in our hives. Colonies in nature are not treated for varroa, so there's selection for resistance to varroa. Colonies in nature live widely dispersed, so there's less spread of disease. Colonies in nature occupy small nest cavities. They have smaller honey stores and more swarming, and through the swarming and the break in the brood rearing, apparently better colony health. Colonies in the wild have thick nest cavity walls, so they enjoy better installation of their nests. And in the wild, bees thoroughly coat their nest walls with propolis. It gives them a strong defense against microbial infections. The reason our, the bees that live in our hives don't coat the inner walls of our hives thickly with propolis is because our hives are made with planed lumber. And it's really clear that one of the, probably the most potent stimulus for bees to collect propolis is experiencing 
little crevices and crannies that they can't keep clean. So what they do is they go and collect propolis and, and fill those cracks and crevices with propolis so that there's not a, there aren't these little surfaces where um, bacteria and mold can, can thrive. My suggestions for beekeeping based on this, and this is a, a work in progress. One suggestion is to get good genes by capture swarms from places with wild colonies. You'll get locally adapted bees uh, with genetic resistance to varroa. And, and I have to, the key here is what I want to stress, you have to capture these swarms from places with wild colonies. Like if you can go out into the countryside or up in the hills or something like that, that's what I do. Because uh, I, no, I don't think there's really any point in putting out bait hives to capture colonies that are coming from a beekeeper's hives. Um, another thing I suggest is to disperse your hives, spread them out, not put them all tied up together in a, in a row like, like almost all of us do. And as you can see, hives done. Third, house your colonies in small hives um, and allow them to swarm. You'll get less honey for sure, but also you'll have lower mite levels. And I'm just trying to strike myself a balance between having colonies in smaller hives, but also still getting some honey by housing colonies in one deep hive body and putting on a shallow super on, for honey uh, on top of that. And then by uh, mid to late June, uh, once they've made a honey crop and, and filled the combs in the, in the shallow honey super, I take that off and then I just leave the colony to live on its own for the rest of the summer. So they have a cavity of a small hive, but you can all still get some honey from them. I also suggest to install propolis collection material on the inner walls of your hives to stimulate building of the propolis shroud. This propolis collection material is this plastic screen material with little slots in it. Bees don't, bees abhor cracks and crevices and slots, so they fill them in with propolis. And here's one that's pretty easy, well, not, not trivial to do, but it's relatively e principle is easy to do. Use hives that provide good insulation. This reduces the thermal stresses on colonies, both summer and winter. And there are a number of hives now being made with polystyrene and things like that. And a lot of beekeepers are experimenting with, with insulation. I think it's one of the most important things we can do in, to help the bees living in our hives. And the last point is suggestions to rear queens from your survivor colonies. You're going to have some colonies that, that survive, even if you don't treat them. And rear from those and you'll maintain a local, help maintain a locally adapted stock that is, has resistance to varroa. Um, if you'd like to learn more about what I've been uh, talking about this evening, about the, how this untold story of the honeybees in the wild, living in the wild, <coughs> Um, I can steer you to this book that I published back in 2019 called The Lives of Bees. And uh, to conclude, I'll, I'll just say I want to thank you for your interest and attention. And I, you can see I've, what I've done here is I've chosen two images, which both are quite dear to me. I love them both, uh, but they illustrate the difference between colonies living in the wild, up on a hollow tree, widely spaced, high up the ground, small nest cavity versus this lovely woodcut that shows an apiary by a, uh, by a stream here. And colonies are close together. They're in big hives, just white boxes. So it's a, it's a different lifestyle. And as we I don't think I've showed to you, um, it's a healthier one here than here, even though these are both um, perfectly acceptable ways for bees to live. Just it's harder in one situation than the other. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude my talk, except to, uh, to, to take questions and, and try to answer them. Okay, that was uh, fantastic. Also, I'd like you to kind of maybe brief discuss your other favorite books that you've written so that people can okay. look and buy any of the other books and uh, get your autograph on them. Well, one book, I mentioned two books in this talk. One is the um, Following the Wild Bees about the uh, bee lining. And the other one at the very end here, The Lives of Bees. Another a, a book that I think, is, was a, I think is really useful for beekeepers to read is called Honeybee Democracy. Um, it's useful and it's fascinating. Useful in the sense that it, it shows you clearly what's going on in a swarm 
um, and it gives some guidance on how how to um, uh, how quickly you how you can tell when a swarms uh, if you find a swarm hanging in a tree you can tell whether it's about to take off or not by listening to the sounds coming out of the swarm by just putting your ear up next to the swarm. But more importantly, it's it's a wonder it's an it's it's a to me it's an amazing or astonishing story of the of what we know about how the scout bees in a in a honeybee swarm the nest site scouts in a honeybee swarm go about the process of choosing the new home for the swarm. It's it's a democratic or kind of decision making process or collective decision making process, and it it's still it still utterly amazes me that the scout bees in a swarm are so wonderfully organized to, to go out, find various possible home sites, run a kind of friendly competition um, or popularity contest on the surface of the swarm um, to see which one is the best. And then once they figured out which one is the best to steer everybody to, to that new home site. So another book I've written, uh, one early one is called um, the wisdom of the hive, and it's about the organization of a colony's food collection process. And it basically goes through what we know about how how a colony works as a kind of honey factory. It's an again, it's an incredible. It's a it's an it tells an amazing. It tells us about reviews what we know about the amazing organization of a colony to be really good at collecting nectar and processing it, um, and to choose among all the day by every day to choose carefully how to allocate the foragers among the flower patches in the countryside around but also how to colony inside the colony how they organize themselves so that they can turn up and turn down the neck the labor involved in processing nectar because some days there's not much nectar coming in but then a few days later if the nectar flow starts up the colony has to really reorganize reallocate its, its worker bees to, so they have lots of bees ready to process the incoming nectar as well as sending out lots of bees to collect the nectar. It's an, it's, again, it's, a, it's another book that tells just some of the absolute beauty of the, of the so behavior and social life of, of honeybees. Thank you for asking me to talk a little about that, Randy. Okay, great. So like I said at the beginning of the talk, if anybody orders a book uh, uh, on Amazon is a great way to get it, then send us or they'll send you a confirmation via email. You forward that confirmation to officers at summitbeekeepers.com. We will send that to uh, Dr. Seeley to sign a book plate for you to stick on the inside of your book. And voila, you got an autographed book. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that's it's a brilliant solution to to uh, not being able to autograph firsthand people's people's books, and I'm really um, uh, grateful to you, Randy, for thinking of this idea. Great, great. So somebody writes, um, I heard something about artificial swarms online. Is that something that would make sense? Uh, brood break plus keeping your bees. Yeah, that is. That, I'm glad that. That question got raised. Yeah, that's another way to uh, actually have a controlled brood break is to make an artificial swarm. And that is to say, go to a colony, find the queen, remove the queen and and work some of the workers and, it, um, and just let the colony requeen itself. It, it will create the fact that the bees have to go about start from scratch and rear a replacement queen means there's going to be a period in which there's no lane. There's going to be about four weeks or even more sometimes in which there's no laying queen, so there's going to be no cells of sealed brood in which the varroa is reproducing. So that, that is another method of, um, of, uh, of mite control, and it's a, it's a good way to increase your colony numbers too. But it, okay. it does, does reduce your honey production, but it, it, it's sort of like life in general. You, you can't have everything. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Seeley, there is a question here. This is Robert. Uh, okay. Yeah. It says, what, what are your thoughts on lay-ins and horizontal hives? The hives are typically made with yeah. thicker walls, but they are larger horizontal cavities. Yeah. Um, I haven't used those, but I know a number of beekeepers that have had very good success with them. And I, I, I kind of wish I were using them because they're so convenient. All, everything's at one level. You don't have to lift, lift um, honey supers off. 
Um, so, and yes, they, they have historically been much, those hives have been built with very good insulation. So there's a lot, a lot to be said for them, these horizontal hives. If you want to learn more about them, there's a really good website just called, it's called Horizontal Hives, I think. It's by a, managed by a, an excellent um, beekeeper in Missouri, I believe. See what else, Robert? Uh, in the wild, did the bees build their nest top down or bottom up with respect to the entrance of the hive? Yeah, um, they always build the combs from the top down. Um, and um, one thing I haven't found is really any consistency in the orientation of the combs with respect to the entrance. You know, I, that was something I looked carefully for, thinking, well, maybe the bees will want to build them the warm way with the combs perpendicular to the axis of the entrance. Um, but no, it, it's just really variable. And there's some old, there's one study in the past that indicates that when a swarm leaves one hive and moves into a, into an empty cavity, they actually read, they, when they build their new combs, they build them in the same compass direction. And, the plane of the combs is oriented in the same compass direction, like from northeast to southwest, as they had in the original hive, and that, or in the original nest. And that may be part of how they organize their comb building, is to just reproduce. Everybody knows what that angle, that orientation was, and thus they know what the new orientation will be for their combs. We have a question here from Anna. She's saying. She's asking, what is the minimum wall thickness you would recommend? Yeah, what, I, what I'm doing, Rebecca, now is I'm, I'm refitting my hives with one and a half inches of polystyrene foam. Um, and it's a work in progress. I wanna see how well that works. So I don't, I don't have, in, from the bees perspective, probably the more is better, but it gets, but, um, um, but it can get awkward for the beekeeper to have really, really thick walled hives. But I would use the light polystyrene foam to get that, to get that insulation so it's not too heavy to lift these boxes off. What I'm using is I'm, I'm converting eight frame, deep eight frame hive bodies and I'm beefing up the walls with this polystyrene foam. And so I don't, so I end up with hive bodies that are a little fatter than than a 10 frame hive body, but still manageable. And they're, and they're, the, the polystyrene is almost, you know, weightless material. And to make the hives sturdy, what I do is I put this polystyrene foam on the outside of the box, and then I put a layer of plywood over the polystyrene. It's a little complicated to say just in words, but you can probably figure out ways to do this. And I, I know you covered, uh, I know you covered this question with your book Honeybee Democracy when you talk about swarming. Raymond is asking, you seem to have good luck trapping swarms. Any advice for someone who has had no luck at all? <laughs> oh, a couple of key points. Um, put the bait hive at least, say 10 feet up off the ground. Um, use an old hive with some old combs in it. Reduce the entrance the bees are real picky about their entrances and so I would if it's a standard Langstroth hive I'd put a block of wood in the entrance so the entrance opening is only two inches or so wide. Um, I'd put wire mesh screen over the entrance so mice don't move into the hive that will make it repellent to bees if, if there's mouse urine smell in there. Um, those, are, those are the main things and, and just be sure to put it up put up your bait hives before the swarming season starts. So uh, some, some height off the ground, um, small entrance, get them up early and put in combs. And that's, um, that's always worked well for me, but of course it's, everybody's experience will differ depending on how many colonies are in an area. And if, if they're mostly beekeepers hives, then they won't be, then the, there probably will not be as many swarms being produced compared to areas that have trees, colonies living in trees, which are much swarmier. But it's, um, 
I have to say, Fina, uh, V Trapper is one of the most fun things to do. <laughs> you, you get freebies and you just enjoy it. It's fun to go out and see, put out the boxes and, and wait and see if, if bees come. Even if they don't come, you've just had a nice day going around checking your boxes. But I, and it, oh, the one last thing I'll say on that point, it's really variable from year to year. Sometimes I tend to put out about 10 bait hives each year. And uh, some years I get 20%, some years I get 100% of the boxes um, attracting a swarm. On average, it's about 50%. And I also find, as I maybe mentioned in my talk, there's some places I get lots of swarms, they work really well, and some places I never get swarms. So after a while, I give up on those. So most of the comments are congratulations to uh, what a tremendous speech, great information, so much to learn, and uh, everybody seemed to really enjoy your talk. Thank you, Randy. Great. I'm delighted. If we missed any questions, guys, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and take advantage of this time with Dr. Seeley. So go ahead and ask any questions you may have. Yeah, and I'll, I'll escape this and maybe I can even see people. Let's see, end show, close this. Uh, okay, yeah. Hi, Dr. Seeley. Um, I was curious about the, um, the study you did with the wild hives versus the Italian BSH and the, the treatment free colonies. Yes. Did you, other than you not doing varroicides, did you treat them or did you uh, manage them in the same way you would manage a, a normal colony or did you keep them at a certain size? Uh, the reason why I asked that is with the, uh, the findings you had with your later studies on the colony size and it's and swarming and its impact on survivability yeah, right, right. if if the if it would have an impact on your overall findings if that makes sense yeah no that's a that's an important point you raise um, all of the colonies were treated the same way set up in the same way were left in just one deep hive body no honey was taken from them they were just left alone and they're all left alone to live in the same way so I think the only, and they're all in the same same location. So I think the only difference um, there was between those three groups of colonies was the origins of their queens. Either the wild, the beekeeper in Vermont, the non-treatment bee, beekeeper in Vermont, or Oliveris in California. It it was um, I was. Um, I, I was actually amazed. I, I, I will mention that I was sort of surprised how badly the Oliveris queens um, handled the Varroa. And I was imp very impressed by how well Kirk Webster's queens do handle Varroa. He, he, he touts them and I, I really believe him. And, and, uh, and what I saw with the wild colonies didn't surprise me either. Cause like, you know, that one wild colony that fell apart with Varroa well, I don't know where my wild swarms come from. That may have come from a beekeeper's hive. Who knows? But that's about what I would expect when you know, you just put out bait hives. You're going to get you're going to get all sorts of colonies. Some from beekeeper's hives. Some from in the trees. Some from people's houses, buildings, things like that. Thank you for the answer. You're yeah, you're welcome. It's an important question. I'm glad you raised it. Okay, any further questions? Go ahead, unmute yourself and chip in. Um, I do have one. The, when you were doing the DNA on the workers, did you do that at Cornell or did you send that out to Dave Tarpey's office? I know Dave Tarpey's group does that also. Yeah, this, this I sent out to one of my um, past students who works now at the, in Japan. And because it was a, I didn't go through it in detail. It's a very sophisticated analysis that looks at this whole genome. It looks mm -hmm. at all across the entire genome of each worker bee um, to get that. And it took him about 
took him about two years to do that genetic analysis. Um, so that's how I did it. I, I, I provided the material, he did mm -hmm. the analysis. Excellent, thank you. I, I have a question. Um, where, like your research is very interesting to read. Where do you look to take your research in the coming years? Like what, what areas do you yeah. think are fruitful areas? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, I, I think what I'm, I think for me the most fruitful direction to take the work is to is to is to examine more closely these uh, um, what recommendations I can give about people that want to do treatment free beekeeping in terms of getting what the how to get the bees get really good bees how to insulate hives what treatments um, what uh, hive setups are best things like that. Just, it's what I, it's, so I'm putting most of my efforts now into um, uh, getting the, getting more and more information about what I would call natural beekeeping or Darwinian beekeeping, um, that sort of thing. I, it's, um, it's something we just, we're still finding our way with. And so I'm putting my efforts in those directions. There what is your preferred yeah. mite treatment? Um, my preferred mite treatment is no treatment because I want, I, um, or maybe that's too bald a statement, no chemical treatment. Um, my preferred mite treatment is to let the colonies, um, give, allow them to live in a smaller hive so I don't get huge honey crops, but they will be, at, they're likely, the colonies are likely to swarm. And so that, that's what I'm doing. I'm not saying that's right for everybody because some people want, really want their, and need their colonies to be, get really large and, and store up a hundred or so pounds of honey. But if you, but I don't. And so I, my, that's my way of, of mite control is to let the bees live in a really well insulated hive, not crowd them in apiaries and to have the hives be relatively small so that the bees can swarm regularly. It's, it's, you know, it's, I, I really appreciate you asking that question because I, I want to amplify it in one way. It, it's this natural beekeeping or that Darwinian beekeeping, whatever you want to call it, that I'm, that I'm exploring is, isn't, certainly isn't for everybody. It's not for somebody that needs a honey, a large honey crop. Um, but I think there's a lot of beekeepers that don't, need a large honey crop. They might, you know, they'd be happy, to, they're fine to have 20 or 30 pounds of honey from their bees every summer, from, from a colony of bees in a summer. And what they really like is just having the bees in their backyard um, or around their house. So that's this kind of net, that somebody with that orientation, um, this approach to beekeeping can work very, very well. It's a little more, more like, it's like having, um, kind of like bird watching almost <laughs> instead of, you know, um, instead of poultry farming. So it's, uh, so that's what I'm, that's what I, that's, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this is Mohammed. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Mohammed. Oh, uh, thank you, doctor, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Appreciate it. A lot of information. Uh, when you mentioned, when you said uh, no chemical uh, uh, treatment, I, I don't treat my bees. I stopped treating them, by the way. Uh, I use essential oils and stuff like that. Uh, I have very small account of uh, mice counts so far, so I hope, uh, I don't know. Uh, but when you say no chemical treatment, uh, some people say that uh, oxalic acid is, occurs naturally. So it's just some crystals and you fume the bees and you're not really... Uh, putting any chemicals there, how do you respond to that? Is, is it really like formic acid and uh, oxalic acid? Is that considered chemical treatment? Uh, do you avoid this uh, two elements? Yeah, I, those would have to be considered chemical treatments because they're, you're introducing chemicals at high levels that are at naturally high levels to the bees. They do kill the mites. It's, um, they can also kill the bees. Um, 
Probably a lot of beekeepers that have used formic acid have lost queens if it can do it on a hot day. Um, but I'm not, yeah, those are, um, I would consider those chemical treatments because neither oxalic acid nor formic acid occurs in nature at those high levels that, that, are, that are created with the, with the treatment. Um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, that, so I think you have to be careful with those techniques. I haven't, I haven't done, I haven't used oxalic acid myself, but I have, I have had difficulties um, treating colonies with formic acid in August when it, when it gets too hot. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yep. It's one of the reasons I no longer use formic acid or anything. I got a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Has anybody... Has anybody tried using rhubarb to kill mites? Yeah, that has oxalic acid in it. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know yeah. any of the details of, of how that has been used. And uh, as a follow up to the to this question and the previous one, um, what am I using? I'm not treating the bees with anything. And people might be wondering, well, what's your colony survival? Right. I'm losing about twenty percent of the colonies every year but I'd, I'd rather lose 20% over winter and then replace them with swarms they capture in the spring and, and, and not have to treat the colonies with chemicals. I'm still treating the bees. I'm still treating them by giving them a, right. a well-insulated hive that's relatively small and letting them swarm. Just not a chemical treatment. Are you replacing them too? Uh, are you replacing them too with uh, about every three to four years then? The queens? The queens? No, I just, I really, I, uh, I, let, I let the bees take care of that. I figure they're the, my, I guess you might say my philosophy is the bees are the best beekeepers. And I, you know, it's, I've talked to a lot of beekeepers okay. about this and, and some of them tell me they've had queens that go for three or four years. I, the most I've seen is a three-year-old queen, but it shows that you don't, certainly don't need to change them every year. At least the bees don't. Yeah. I draft, so mm -hmm. I was just kind of interested in what you had to say. Yeah, how do you, Thank um, you. how do you choose which which um, do you go to do you graft from colonies that are doing especially especially well that have show good resistance to disease or how do you choose your grafting material? I have got uh, right now. I've got a swarm from down the Ohio River. Um, I got daughters, like four daughters off of her. Mm -hmm. um, and they've gotten by, um, I'd say they're pushing two years now. And I've got probably, you know, four of them and I've drafted off of them. Plus I've got uh, queens from Conrad's Honey and Hive, which they get them down south off of Rosemary. And I've got two two hives off Conrad, and uh, they're doing uh, doing very good. I've got daughters mm -hmm. off of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, there's good stock out there, um, but I I I feel like I I do have more just more basic confidence in the bees that it will come to me from the wild because those nobody's helped them it's they've they've shown they've demonstrated their vigor to me right i'm so planning on drafting the mite chewer rod too mm -hmm. this year yep doctor i know you don't treat but do you still measure the mite level in your colonies yes i do for example in those studies i i, I that's what i do yeah because i do want to know what's going on and yeah, you can predict really well if a colony's, if it's got in, in August, if it has um, more than a you know, sample of 300 bees, I use the sugar shake or alcohol wash. If I've, got, if I've got 20 mites in a sample of 300 bees, I know that colony is gonna die. It's, it's on the way out. And so I actually will euthanize the colony because I don't want it to turn into, I don't want it to die and then 
get have bees come and rob it out and pick up lots of mites from it. So yeah, I do keep track of mite levels. Well, speaking of uh, powder sugar, uh, Tim is asking, what do you think of that as a treatment? I, um, that's, I'm glad that question's been asked. I, I think a number of people have looked at that and they found it has no effect on treating the mites and controlling mites. It's, it's good for measuring the mite levels in the sugar shake test, but it doesn't just sprinkling it in a hive. There's, there's no evidence at all, to the best of my knowledge, that it, that it control, helps control mites, helps reduce mite population. Maybe one way would be to put a few pounds of sugar and shake the hive and see what's... <laughs> <laughs> that would probably work. <laughs> I've done that. So with, with that, I think I'll uh, introduce our the next speaker. I would encourage everyone to put on their calendar for December 3rd is uh, uh, another author, Dewey Karen, oh, yeah. is going to be speaking to the group. You can sign on to Dr. Seeley. Okay. And uh, he's going to be talking about the, um, well, he just completed the, the complete uh, bee handbook and also works with the Honey Bee Health Coalition that yeah. talks quite a bit about Varroa and uh, the best treatment methods and what they use. And uh, the yeah. powdered sugar is one of the options that they discuss uh, as, a, as a potential. Mm. Okay, yeah, mm. good. Yeah, Dewey, Dewey's a, uh, he's a Cornellian. He's a very reputable, very knowledgeable guy. He will give you an excellent talk, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, he will. <laughs> okay, well, I hope our, our paths will cross again, maybe at a, when we can get together at things like Eastern Apicultural Society meetings. So yeah. thank you very again for inviting me this evening. It's been, been my pleasure, to, uh, especially to receive your questions and because some of them have, have been really thought provoking and it's good, that's always, that's always good to, it's always good to, good to work with. Thank you very much for your time, nice Doctor. Time. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. And Wonderful. thank you again, Robert and Randy for hosting me. Good.